And thanks everybody, good morning. My name is JJ Frost and I'm long sitting right here with Matt McCander. Um, I heard uh, in the roll call that co-author Peter Nelson is on the line with us, which is great. And uh, also recognize Christopher Swingley here at ABR in Fairbanks. So we'll just dive right into it. So you see the title there. Um, we're gonna talk today about some pretty detailed mapping work that we've been doing um, covering a pretty large swath in northern Alaska, uh, looking at plant functional types in Arctic tundra. And okay, so briefly, if you're in ecology, terrestrial ecology, sooner or later you're going to need to make a map, right? Mapping is um, ecosystem maps are foundational tools for all sorts of applications across disciplines, and then certainly looking uh, at things like monitoring. Um, of different ecosystem properties, permafrost, um, and a lot of other topics um, related to Arctic tundra environments. And a typical approach is we go out in the field, collect a lot of ground data, we make, um, we make maps out of ecosystem classes that we've determined from the field, and increasingly we're using uh, emerging remote sensing data sets and capabilities um, to make maps and to scale up from the plot scale to uh, larger areas. The motivation of our study uh, began um, with uh, over the last decade with increasing interest in offshore oil uh, in the Chukchi um, continental shelf. And uh, if that were to ever go forward, there would be a need to get oil from the Chukchi coast, somewhere on the Chukchi coast over to the Trans-Alaska pipeline. So those of you familiar with Northern Alaska, you know that's a, that's a long way, it's a big area. And so we had this really large area for which um, we needed to construct some baseline mapping um, products to support studies related to that. So big area, about 100,000 square kilometers shown there encompassing most of the National Petroleum Reserve, or NPRA. So traditional mapping methods um, for an area that size, so you might start with a vector-based approach where you use high resolution imagery that you can see at the upper left, and then you uh, map the individual units either manually or in some other technique. And that gives you a really detailed sort of map um, using central uh, map classes. Um, and it's a time consuming thing to do. And the consolidating variability on the landscape into those classes, um, depending on what you're doing, it could be desirable. But in other cases, there's variability that you are probably missing. Um, same with a raster based map for a larger area. You've got a huge study area and you're consolidating into some classes that you can realistically map. Good for some applications, not so great for others. And uh, one application it's not great for, I think, is uh, for emerging monitoring using remote sensing. And to borrow a phrase from Matthew Sturm, we know that the map is changing. So those uh, sorts of classifications have a certain shelf life. There's things happening on the landscape, whether it's disturbance or long-term changes related to climate. And some of those changes on the ground might capture a change in map class across one of those um, thematic maps. For example, tall shrub expansion, um, that's a clear shift. But a lot of other changes over time are probably going to be happening within the map classes themselves, where vegetation might be changing, but not enough to bring you from one class to another. So what you're really after is something uh, can sort of a quantitative or continuous field map. And uh, that sort of product gives you a good tool for monitoring. Uh, it serves as an input to earth system models, for example, maybe related to permafrost, because vegetation has such an influence on permafrost properties, which are hard to measure otherwise. Uh, wildlife related studies, surface energy balance, the list goes on and on. And a really, uh, really, if you're going to do a continuous field map, uh, you'd like to stratify it by something that's ecologically uh, relevant, meaningful, and plant functional types is a, is a widely used um, basis for division. And in our case, uh, you know, plant functional types are dictated by things like vascularity of the plants, their structural properties, um, and so forth. So we define uh, nine plant functional types for Arctic tundra shown here, and I won't dwell on this too much other than to point out some of the breakpoints in the shrub classes. 
Um, we drew those from the Alaska Vegetation Classification, um, which of course is, is sort of a real standard for work in Alaska. So basically, if you're interested in tall shrubs, that's a meter and a half high. And there's a few species in particular uh, that tend to a a attain that height um, in Arctic tundra. And you can see on down the line. Um, so several shrub classes, several herbaceous classes, and two nonvasculars. We also aggregated those plant functional types into broader groups. So here we've added uh, five more, um, what I'll continue to call plant functional types. These are just sort of aggregate types in which you've lumped all shrubs together and so on. And then in addition to the plant functional types, there's three uh, map units related to uh, either dead vegetation or litter, water or bare soil. And so just as we'll be coming back to this figure repeatedly um, as we kind of build, build up uh, the inputs to, to, our, um, to our map algorithm and then present the results. The overall framework looks something like this, and you'll see all of these inputs um, from remote sensing, from field data. Um, we're using the random forest data mining algorithm. It's really a critical um, piece of all this in terms of methods in which we're bringing in these disparate data sets um, and trying to get the information content out of all of them uh, to give us uh, maps for each of these plant functional types. So in the end, we'll get these spatial models or maps of all of the plant functional types and the aggregate types. And we'll talk a little more about what it is, how exactly we define cover of vegetation and other, the other response variables. I'll turn it over to Matt now. And um, yeah, well, so the um, we use two flavors of the random forest algorithm, and this is a data mining algorithm. And um, some of the advantages are that it that it permits the use of of a great number of um, predictor variables, and and it's okay for the for the modeling generally if there are correlations between the predictors, and we're using a lot of spectral predictors from from different dates, so there is a lot of um, a lot of correlation as well as some important differences between those dates. Um, random forest can be good at recovering nonlinear linear relationships and, and it uses a, a bootstrapping process of your, with your um, training data that randomly selects um, both predictors and, and uh, plot data um, at, for, for a number of different um, trees and so that also gives you unbiased um, estimates of the of the accuracy and model performance um, from the uh, from the training data, and so um, let's talk about the the field training data that we use. This was an intensive um, in situ um, effort um, from both the uh, from some work that ABR did and also the BLM assessment inventory and monitoring program, and it was based on the um, point intercept vegetation sampling method. So you lay out a, a, a tape and then um, sample at regular intervals along that tape with a, a laser that's pointing straight down and you record um, the order of, of vegetation hits from top to bottom um, to the species level and also um, record the vegetation height at um, not quite as, not at a one fifth of the point, so you sample the vegetation structure that way. So you get both the order of the vegetation layers and a um, point measurement of the cover. So it's a proxy for some um, other measures like leaf area index. Um, it can be related to above ground biomass, um, forage quantity for wildlife studies. Unlike some other methods, um, it's fairly rapid and non-destructive. This is used for a lot of long-term monitoring projects by um, agencies and industry in Alaska, and it's also um, well suited for scaling from um, plot scale to remote sensing measurement. It's also very repeatable. It's a systematic way of measuring vegetation. Our um, plot layout, this was based on the, uh, on the BLM's assessment inventorying and monitoring protocol as applied for tundra in Alaska. And so um, plot dimensions ranged, uh, some of them were three by 50 meters and some were three by, um, so they were yeah, lines radiating out that were 50 meters or else 25 meters long. Sample points, um, every 
uh, half a meter to 2.5 meters. And then when we have this point intercept data, there's some different ways that we can that we can summarize it. And the most common way is um, just percent cover, which is the percent of the points where that where that species or functional type occurs. And some other ways of, of summarizing the data, um, you could look at the top cover, which is just the first hit at each point um, over the over the plot, and that is what would be most visible um, to remote sensing methods looking down from above. And if you're interested in um, structure and leaf area index, and if you recorded multiple hits of the same species, you can also get a hit density. So that is sort of the um, how many how many layers of vegetation there are of a particular species. And so this is just an example of those cover metrics um, summarized by functional type for these uh, for, for three sort of representative environments. Um, we have a, a low willow shrub that has a high high cover of, uh, of both tall and low shrubs. Um, shrub tussock tundra, which is composed largely of uh, sedges with um, low and low and dwarf shrubs cover being really high, and then a, a partially vegetated, um, which is dominated by bare ground with um, sparse cover of, of shrubs and, and forb and some other, um, other plants there. You can also see that the hit density in some of these is much higher than the, the regular cover, because we can have, that's where we're including um, information from, from multiple layers of of vegetation, and so the um, we had a total of uh, 224 field plots that were um, collected across our study area by this method, and you can see that the the red are the um, data plots that that ABR collected in the field in 2012. Um, the green are what the um, BLM collected as part of their um, assessment, inventory, and monitoring program and um, over the course of three summers. And then to balance that out, our study area is about 10% um, or 10 percent of the study area is covered by water, but we weren't actually doing um, the point intercept method over water, so we photo interpreted um, 20, 20 plots that were representative of different water types to balance out that um, balance out that ground training sample. Yeah, so uh, for those of you familiar with the North Slope, um, you know there's, there's actually a lot of um, uh, variability across that region uh, that sets up some really important environmental gradients. So our mapping effort is, is happening across uh, several really major gradients that translate into different, uh, generally in terms of abundance of uh, shrubs across the landscape, shrub height and density. Um, if you look, again, at just the long-term record of mean annual temperature across the region, so coastal locations and inland locations, they actually stack up on each other pretty well. Uh, every, everywhere looks about the same if you just look at mean annual temperature, but then if you look at it seasonally in the summer, um, there's a really broad, uh, a, a, a really intense summer temperature gradient. And you see an inland station like Umiat is at the top, averaging about 10 degrees C, uh, summer temperature all the way down to, you know, a little, little better than 2 degrees uh, at Barrow. Uh, other important gradients include some broad divisions in substrate, landscape history. Um, towards the south, you have the Brooks Range foothills, so more of an upland landscape. Um, and then the coastal plain. And One's flat, one's hilly, but even within those, there's some important differences in terms of the, the near-surface soils. Uh, on the coastal plain, that's the Eolian sand sheet, and then in the brooks, uh, the sort of Yetima belt or really silt-rich um, soils, whereas further south, you tend to get to rockier soils. And just some uh, aerial photos that show you some of that, some of the differences. Likewise, uh, physiography, so local controls on soil and landform development. Um, we have some broad divisions here, riverine, upland, lowland. 
and again, very uh, can sometimes start differences in vegetation over small distances. Lowland example. And then, uh, so back to you, Matt, to talk about the spectral inputs and remote sensing. Um, yeah, so for our um, continuous cover maps by plant functional type, our, our primary inputs really were, um, were seasonal Landsat composites. And so um, this was combined from, uh, from Landsat 5, 7, and, and 8 data over the, um, the 2010 to 2015 time period. So we wanted to, to capture the sort of the, the um, normal reflectance at different seasons from sort of from, from early June through, through late August. So just between, you know, from the, uh, the snow free season basically. And so we have um, our six reflective Landsat bands, um, blue, green, red, near infrared, and, and two of the shortwave infrared bands. We also did um, a number of, of spectral indices. So that was uh, NDVI and also the, uh, the enhanced vegetation index. Um, this is EVI2, a flavor that, that leaves out the, the blue band, which tends to be heavily affected by um, sort of atmospheric artifacts. We also included the um, normalized different wetness index and moisture index and the normalized different snow index, um, which also is the, the converse of an index that's used to um, estimate lichen cover and, and lichen biomass. And finally, the um, normalized burn ratio. And so this is looking at um, what sort of the what the seasonal composites look like, and so sort of the, the first six, uh, we, have, we have the Landsat reflectance from, from early June, and this is the, the first half of June, and then the late June, um, early July, and then we have our, our midsummer um, Landsat composite, and this is, so at the, the middle of the summer, you tend to get a plateau, so this is from the middle of July until the middle of August, and um, and so that's a little bit longer, but it tends to be a plateau. It also tends to be a lot cloudier in the middle of the summer. And so having that longer period really helps us um, get enough observations to get the sort of the central tendency over, um, over the whole study area. And the final one was, was late August. So this is when you really are starting to see um, senescence. And then we find when you go much past the end of August, you get into issues with um, low sun angle. Um, shadows and and early snow. The other um, the other thing I want to point out that we um, so that in, in an environment like this, there's sort of the the snow melt pattern can be pretty dynamic and and snow melts at different times. But one of the sort of really important um, spectral end members we think is sort of the the brown tundra. So what the what the tundra looks like. Um, after the snow melts, but before it really starts to, to green up. And so we actually um, captured that by, by combining observations from um, four different periods, from that, that early June through early July, um, and tried to, and then, and then selected, in that case, for the, the low, um, low near infrared reflectance, which tended to select both away from snow um, and select away from green vegetation. And so the, um, to, to do this, we had, we had cloud mass Landsat data. We used uh, five-year periods, 2011 through 2015. And the, uh, so the rule we used in most cases was to select the median near infrared. Um, in the early period, um, that was a little bit problematic because we would tend to get um, we wanted to select away from the snow cover, so we used the, the lowest lowest 20% of near infrared reflectance, and then that was the rule that was used to select which observation was used for our composite. Um, and that that 20th percentile of near infrared was really critical. We thought to get that um, to get that brown tundra composite selected from multiple dates. Um, so yeah, here's just what some of the um, the, indi the indices then look like. 
um, over that study area. And so you can see this is an area that requires sort of dozens of Landsat scenes to cover, but we do get a really um, a seamless product over that over that large study area. Now we'll talk, um, in addition to our spectral predictors, we have some environmental predictors, um, and that was including, uh, so related to, to, to climate and, and seasonality as well as terrain. Um, summer warmth index. We also have um, the, some, some interesting uh, seasonal metrics, and one of these is the, um, the, normal, um, the normal snow free date over, a, over sort of the climatological normal snow free date over a period of a couple decades. So this is based on an analysis of all the available Landsat data when that landscape normally transitions from snow covered to snow free. Um, we also did an assessment of the um, seasonal water frequency. So there are a lot of permanent water bodies, but there's also a lot of, um, a lot of flooding. And particularly in the spring, um, when all the snow melts and there's a very flat terrain without um, drainage in some areas. So we um, did an analysis of, of all the available um, Landsat imagery with the classification to water and then actually analyze that over the course of the season. So this is mainly focusing on the, the changes in water extent over the season um, throughout a normal, um, a normal summer. And so we use the uh, conditional random forest algorithm as a tool to select predictors. And the, this is, um, there is, and you could run an assessment of variable importance um, with different random forest flavors, but some of them, the normal random forest is sort of um, biased towards identifying correlated predictors as important. And so there is sort of a different flavor that, that can solve that problem, um, but it is sort of much, much slower. So we use, um, so we use this conditional um, variable importance to actually identify the important predictors and put us in a position to, to evaluate models that have a reduced set of predictors because our total set here is 78 different predictors between the different dates and the different indices and the, um, the environmental predictors. So, so we use, um, this gives us, an, this is an example of what that ranked, um, if you rank the predictors then you would typically see a curve like this where you sort of get um, a few predictors that are the most important, and then there's sort of an inflection point where it really sort of levels off. And you could draw that point at some different, you could try drawing that at a, at a couple different places, but it will really give you um, a parsimonious model. And so what we did was we compared results from sort of the um, most parsimonious models to some reduced models, with, uh, or, or to, the, to the model that had um, all of our 78 predictors. And so let's look at some results. And uh, you know, it's not lost on us the irony that we're using random forests to map plant functional types in tundra. So um, that's where those chainsaws uh, that you saw earlier came in, trim those uh, from the forest. So, um, so here's uh, two looks at, we'll start out actually with one of the aggregate plant functional types, this is the broadest one you could really have, total vascular plant cover. So all vascular plant functional types put together. And using the Landsat, um, at the Landsat scale, you get a map that's useful for many purposes. So you see the broad brush uh, patterns across the region. And again, they're very clean. Um, they do conform to our conception of um, total plant cover on the north slope with the highest values in warmer inland areas in the foothills. So you see that. And then uh, also at the lower left, that's just an example of a landscape level variability near Umiat, where there's some important abrupt changes in soils that's reflected in, in shrub cover in particular. And you see that reflected. So um, there's a lot of really rich spatial patterns. And again, with the 30 meter resolution, there's a lot you can do. So um, for total vascular plants, again, that's, uh, that's a pretty easy one to do in the sense that you've, you've lumped a lot of the plant functional types together. 
um, just using the sort of taking the full model, so using all predictors and using all of the training data set um, with the random forest algorithm, we can well, we can produce a scatter plot like this, and also derive a sort of a pseudo R squared value um, by comparing the plots that went into the training into the uh, the model and comparing it to the observed values. So, um, pretty tight correlation here, and you do see a tendency. Um, where at low actual cover values, we tend to overestimate cover a little bit, and likewise at high cover values, underestimate. So, um, you know, at either end, low biomass and really high biomass, um, the, cur the, the line is, is flatter than it's below the one-to-one -one line at high values. Yeah, the, the, um, black, the black is the one-to-one -one line, and the, the red is the best fit through, the, uh, through that observed data. Um, I think this step of predictor selection, so I just showed you a model that used all predictors, um, but we can also rank, you know, which were which seemed to be the, the predictors that had the highest explanatory value. And we had a lot of predictors. There were 78 total that went in. Um, so there's some pretty instructive patterns um, that we can, I think, have some implications for using remote sensing to monitor different plant functional types. So for total vascular cover, primarily, what jumps out at me is the top five predictors, they're all indices. They're not the raw um, surface reflectance values from individual bands, and they're not the environmental predictors. So EVI shows up, NDVI, and uh, primarily the sort of the peak season, um, July, August, showing up um, seem to be most important for total vascular cover. Uh, but now let's start to get down, winnow down to individual plant functional types. So we'll just look at shrubs tall, low, dwarf, evergreen, deciduous, all of them. And again, we see some broad patterns that uh, make a lot of sense across the landscape, and again, some um, pretty intricate landscape level patterns. And we look at uh, the high resolution archive, give us a means to evaluate the results. So pretty tight here again, it looks pretty similar to the last plot. And with shrubs, again, the indices seem to be really important, and uh, and, and we're mainly looking at late June, early July, so early summer seems to be a key period. But several different uh, seasons represented there. Now if we move down into just low and tall shrubs, so everything about ankle high and above, and these are all deciduous species as well, um, our, square, our squared value starts to decline a little bit. Uh, what we're looking at here is a reduced model where we're just using nine predictors that had high uh, explanatory power. And if you look at the inset map, again, near Umiat, that's an area where you have a lot of uh, really high biomass shrublands, and that comes through really nicely in the results. Um, but if you go down to the level of an individual plant functional type, in this case, tall shrubs, uh, the model's performance is not quite as good. Um, there's a lot of confusion with low shrubs, and I think those of us that study Arctic shrubs, that's not terribly surprising because there's a few species of willows in particular that have a lot of plasticity. Um, they can be low, they can be tall, depending where you find them on the landscape. But to the satellite, um, the, it's, uh, it's a really similar sort of signature that they provide. So some confusion as you get down to finer PFTs, but still pretty good results, I think, compared to uh, past efforts. So for deciduous shrubs, now there's some real strong patterns in uh, the top predictors. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, early July. So early July, basically the month of July, and that makes a lot of sense for these these deciduous shrubs. They're higher biomass. Um, they really do have a um, well. They produce a pretty strong signal to the overpassing satellite in terms of productivity. Yeah, seasonally, they um, they have a, an advantage in getting that that sort of their, their leaves out and getting fully greened up a little bit sooner in the season. So I think that may be why we see the early July time window coming out, which is really before the overall peak. But I think at that, that midsummer peak, you would get more confusion of the, of the deciduous shrubs with some of the herbaceous vegetation that, in particular, the you know, sedges reach their peak. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It take longer to get there. Yeah, and a lot of herbaceous plants, sedges, tussocks, 
um, they tend to, you know, primarily you see litter until you get uh, well into the summer uh, before their green biomass really starts to become uh, really conspicuous. <clears throat> so, you know, we worked with, with a lot of different PFTs and uh, we got some pretty fine scale PFTs. Um, and I think, I don't know that there's been many attempts to do this. Um, but we were interested in looking at, at dwarf evergreen shrubs. So there's a few genera of shrubs that are really common, particularly in the foothills, uh, evergreen leaf habit. And, um, well, our models seem to do a pretty good job of, uh, of picking these out and mapping them. And we had, uh, I was really actually pretty surprised by this result. Um, you can look at the scatter plot. Uh, again, there's a lot of, lot of noise there, um, but overall pretty strong results. And I think it's really interesting to look at the predictors for evergreens, um, where the early sort of that brown tundra composite seem to be really important. And that makes a lot of sense uh, recognizing that, you know, the leaf chemistry of these shrubs, when the snow melts, uh, they, have a, they look very different than deciduous shrubs, obviously, which aren't bearing any leaves at all. So uh, interesting to see these early season metrics were yeah. predicted. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about trying to put this work in context to some past efforts at um, quantitative cover mapping. Yeah, well, this isn't the you know this isn't the first uh, percent shrub map for northern Alaska. And so we did we did a comparison with the um, this is a, a map by by Beck and others that came out in 2011. Um, I think I think Scott was part of this study. And so the, what we're doing, focusing on here is there was um, just the, the percent shrub map that was included, um, that was part of the, the Beck um, work. There was also a, a tall shrub map that we might talk about a different time. But so just fo focusing on percent shrubs and it sort of, to start with, it raises the question, well, what, what is a shrub? And, you know, we talked just briefly about all the, the deciduous, or sorry, the evergreen, the evergreen shrubs, these are, these are woody, um, plants as well, but so in any case, in the Beck paper, the um, shrubs were nominally defined as, as willows, alders, and, and, and birch, and and so um, and since we have sort of this detailed measurement, we have two panels here on the left. Um, we're comparing that that Beck shrub map to the closest maps that we have, which is our percent um, deciduous shrub map. So that includes all the willows, birch, and and alder, and, and a few other um, relatively minor components like blueberry. And so um, when we're looking at here is sort of a, a heat map where, where this is a, a scatter plot of, or a, of all of the, you know, this is an overlap of, of matching pixels. And so the yellow represents the high densities. And so you, you will see um, one of the characteristics of that Beck map was that there was really high modes on zero percent shrub cover and then 100 percent shrub cover. So a lot of the a lot of the map here was, um, in that case, was saturated. Whereas from this, um, our, our analysis of the deciduous shrubs, there was really nothing achieved quite 100 percent shrub cover by the um, point intercept data. And sort of the important thing here is really if you look at that blue line, which is the best fit, what you see is that the, there's about a fourfold sort of difference in the magnitude. So when um, one map, when the, when the Beck percent shrub map sort of reaches 100 percent, ours is on average about uh, 25 percent, although there, there still is a big range. Um, the other thing that's interesting, then if you say, well, what about when we add in those dwarf evergreen shrubs, which are a really big part of the landscape, and so that's what you see on the right. So that is our sort of percent shrub map of all shrubs, but we're including more than just willow, alder, and birch. We're including the um, dryas and the cassiope. And so when you actually include all the shrubs, then there, there still is um, sort of a broad scatter, but the central tendency is that they come much closer. Um, there's less of a bias between, between the two analyses. And that one thing that suggests is that maybe, um, you know, there was other things besides just the the willows and alders and birch that, that they were actually sort of including in their shrub category, even if they didn't know it. Um, so, so what are some of the takeaways from this? So why do we see such a big difference? Um, so they were both Landsat-based maps, but there was about a decade of time difference. Um, 
first was based on 99 to 2002 data. Our map was based on 2011 to 2015 data. Um, I don't think anyone thinks there's been that much change over that time period, but there could be a little. We also um, used seasonal composites, so we um, bracketed sort of the whole growing season, whereas the earlier work was just included midsummer data. And we did do an analysis of, we compared our models from uh, midsummer, if we, um, if we only use midsummer Landsat data, um, our R squared was lowered by typically about 0.1. Um, I think the big difference is sort of in the, the methods of defining cover. And so the um, spec work was done by image interpretation, um, whereas ours was based on extensive in situ point cover measurements. And so it also really, because of the image interpretation of shrub, not shrub, at sort of a two to five meter pixel level, what they're sort of measuring is a binary um, cover or a canopy cover. So you picture drawing like an outline around a shrub and everything inside that is defined as shrub. Whereas the foliar cover is what we're measuring where actually there's green leaves um, at a true point scale. And it's interesting if you look at these examples at the bottom, you just wonder, well, what is like a canopy, can you even measure canopy cover, especially when you start getting into the low tundra where there's a trailing, um, trailing sort of growth form. Um, and we just have a, a couple more, a um, couple more examples of some functional type mapping. So this is um, getting at the, the non-vasculars. And here we have, um, so this is a reduced model with, with uh, 14 predictors. Um, we also can see that results are decent, um, but not great for, um, if we break that into mosses alone or lichens alone, um, 0.52 and 0.58. Um, here's the sort of the scatter plot of the non-vascular model. Again, sort of a little bit of an overestimate at low values and an underestimate at, at high values. Um, a really, and you get to the non-vascular, it's a really interesting grab bag of top, um, what, are, what are some of the top predictors. Um, so we get um, both early season and midsummer, um, some different indices. The magnitude is the change from, uh, from the spring to the midsummer. And then one, uh, one midsummer metric, in this case red, which I don't know, may relate to some of the, some of the moth colors. Um, and then finally, just our, um, these are the abiotics. So some of the, not the plant functional types per se, but, but we also get, in this case, the, um, the top cover both for, um, for water, for bare ground, and for litter. So I think these kind of products could be really interesting and useful for some, um, for some different studies. Well, to wrap it up, um, Speaking first about, I th again, I think some implications, I think we'll emphasize monitoring as, as um, in particular in these conclusions. So from a remote sensing uh, based approach, I think we learned some good lessons um, for different plant functional types. So it's sort of the right tool for the right job. And I think um, number one, getting a really clean Landsat data set and one that's broken out to give you a multi-temporal seasonal look at the landscape across the, the summer is really key for this. Um, so again, early July seems to be really the, the hot spot for deciduous shrubs. Um, that spring period was really key for evergreens and also for the non-vasculars, which actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, spectral indices were, were really important, but particularly the vegetation indices. Um, I'd like to think the environmental predictors would be important, but it turned out uh, that spectral techniques actually uh, appeared to, in most cases, serve just fine on their own. Um, and I think all of this has implications for remote sensing-based monitoring. Um, and then it's also thinking about the field methods that we used, those are all designed for long-term monitoring. So I think the carrying forward, um, you know, these maps can be updated. The Landsat record is alive and growing, and so the composites can be updated. And also, as part of the monitor monitoring effort, um, you're going to have new, uh, new field-based information to continue monitoring. So I'm seeing this as potentially two, two techniques that can be you know, pulled together in a systematic way and carried on. Um, so we mapped the functional types across 
Well, it's huge, right? Um, Kentucky, about the size of the state of Kentucky, a little better. Um, we see a lot of our known environmental gradients reflected in the products. Um, we did a pretty good job with shrubs, but, you know, we didn't do as well as we'd hoped in some cases for some uh, really key plant functional types. Um, and so, Matt, I think that's keep bringing us about yeah, that. No, I think, yeah, we do. You know, we did mention earlier that there's a lot of agencies that are collecting this kind of data um, as far as the, the grounds in situ is for their long-term monitoring projects. And so um, me and uh, Peter Nelson are, are working with Scott Getz on a NASA above project that is going beyond just the NPRA, but pulling in some of the park service and the fish and wildlife service. Um, and so we're sort of expanding this effort, in particular for, for shrub cover and for lichen cover um, across the, the Arctic above domain. So I think with that, uh, we'd like to acknowledge some really key people who have been involved in this. Um, you know, there was actually, if you can imagine the, that map with all of the field plots, for anybody that does field-based work in the Arctic, you look at that map and you look at all those plots, it's a lot of work. And uh, there were some effectively, you know, a small army of um, field biologists that collected all those data, both here at ABR and also uh, we really thank the folks at BLM. Um, so with that, I know, uh, I hope we've got some time for questions. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you guys. That was great. Um, yeah, that was as interesting and more than, than what I was hoping for from having seen your poster at HEU last year. Um, I've got several questions myself, but before kind of taking over the floor, I'd, I would like to see if uh, anyone else has some questions ready to go. And I should point out, too, that you might have to remember to unmute yourself. Okay, well, um, if there are no other questions right now, one that I have that jumps right out is um, I'm curious the, the reaction you got and the buy-in you got from the idea of trying to maybe um, standardize some of these measurements across different agencies within the state of Alaska and, um, and, and kind of where that's at right now up in the North Slope and maybe elsewhere. Yeah, no, like, you know, I, I think there's a minimum, there's sort of a minimum commonality when you're talking about uh, vegetation point intercept data. But, um, and so that, that does give you a certain way of measuring cover that's sort of different as we saw than you would get if you're just doing it from trying to interpret satellite imagery, even high resolution satellite imagery. But there are many, many different nuances in how the different agencies are doing this. Um, and I think at this point, like, they're really kind of, they're different, they're already part of long-term monitoring programs, so within each agency or within each park, it's probably more important to sort of stick with the methods they have for specific comparability. But we are able to sort of summarize the data in such a way that we get it, we try to understand what the different nuances are and represent the, like the basic, um, the basic commonality. So there can be some important differences and still um, we're able to, to sort of combine combine the data as long as we're careful about it. Okay, yeah, so the so the take home there is that even with, with differing methods among things like LCC, the INM program with the Park Service or BLM, um, even though there are differences in their protocols, uh, if you are familiar with what you're doing, you can extract at least the most relevant information and be able to more or less reproduce this, is that right? Yes. Okay. Have you yeah, thought about yeah. writing up a, like a best practices document or something like that for, for this sort of thing? That's, uh, well, that's a good idea. And I know, you know, that certainly, I know Skip Walker has, um, has been really active in that and trying to arrive at, um, you know, sort of a standardized way of, of sampling vegetation for monitoring and other applications. You know, and we know this. I mean, we all get out in the field and um, there's a lot of, <laughs> commonalities in the way people apply field methods, but then everybody's got their own ideas. And But like you alluded, I think the, at minimum, you know, a minimum goal is to just have protocols that um, can be harmonized, that you can harmonize the data 
mm -hmm. um, and apply them. But like Matt said, you know, there's a lot of legacy effects um, for long-term monitoring efforts that, you know, once you've got a time step in that program, it's it's really tough to uh, to sort of change your practices dramatically anyway. Yeah, right. Absolutely. I, I will yeah. mention that. It's really encouraging that you found ways to adapt to what's already there. Um, yeah. And, you know, keep in mind moving forward that this sort of thing you're doing, it, it takes a while. It takes a half an hour to explain what you're doing and convey the, the value of it because it, it involves some complexity um, and also benefits from this sort of collaboration. So given the role of IARPIC and, and of the terrestrial team, you know, if you need help with that down the road, you know, think of that as a resource. Okay. Great. Yeah, no, part of the part of the NASA above project that Peter and I and, and Scott are, are working on is to sort of take that disparate data from the different agencies and other sources and sort of harmonize it and, and pool it together in a in a format that is much easier for someone to use. Okay, great. Um, well, is, is anyone else um, thinking about asking questions at this point? If not, we can move on to um, Andrew. Andrew, sorry to interrupt. Cynthia Dinwiddie had a question which she typed in. Um, are, are there peer-reviewed publications in the literature on this study and prior studies? Yeah. No, we're uh, we're we're finalizing that right now. So that yeah, the prior study that we had mentioned is is uh, there's a paper in that I think an article from. 2011, but yep. And there's been a, at least one other effort to do uh, sort of fractional um, cover mapping of shrubs, and I think that was in 2010. I think uh, David Selkowitz published something from that work, uh, Remote Sensing of Environment. But yeah, we're trying to get a manuscript out the door on this, um, so stay tuned. Yeah, and certainly when you get it out, that would be a great thing to post on the website so people can find it. Yeah, Thanks. and actually, um, I, you know, we hope to get the not just the paper but the, the map products themselves um, in a place where people can readily use them. Because, again, the applications, I think, for this um, sort of mapping, um, there's, there's a lot of different applications. Again, for the modeling community um, and just the broader terrestrial ecology community. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted. Great. Yeah, thanks again. That, that, um, that turned out great. Oh, and it looks like we may be, uh, okay, yeah, we had a question about posting the slideshow. Um, yeah, the webinar will be posted um, on the IRPIC webpage as well, so it'll be available. Um, and, and thank you guys again. That was, that was a great fit, and I really enjoyed it.